become a real poker player. I do. All right, guys, now we're into the fun stuff. Like I said before, knowing people is half the battle in poker. The great thing about the game of poker is that you don't have to have the best hand to win. It takes psychology, acting ability, and guts to pull off what is the icing on the cake in the game, the bluff. Why do you think poker is taking Hollywood by storm? Everyone wants to play it. Actors love to act, and there is nothing better than pulling off a successful bluff. It takes deceptiveness, timing, and absolute guts to do it properly. It's put up or shut up time, and your own cash is on the line. It defines who you are as a person, and the results are immediate for all to see. This is the stuff that'll make you or break you. So let's learn to read people and bluff anyone. If you've played poker before, you know that you have to pay careful attention to what's going on in the game. You need to concentrate on the important things like watching the other players play their hands. Get into the habit of not looking at your hand until it's your turn to act. When the play passes to you, decide how you want to play the hand. If you muck it, then it's over until the next hand. If you decide to play, memorize the hand, place it in front of you with a chip on it to protect it, and then try not to look down at your cards again because you could be giving away tells by going back to your cards. When the flop is all of one suit, you will often see another player immediately double check his whole cards. This reaction usually means that he has exactly one card of that said suit and he's checking to see which one of his whole cards it is. So, you know that he does not yet have the flush. Don't do your opponents any favors by providing them with similar knowledge about your hand. Of all the things that a Hold'em player can do to improve his hourly rate, one of the easiest is to give some thought to which seat to take at the table. Picking the right seat can actually mean the difference between winning and losing. Knowledge is power. Everybody knows that, right? At the Hold'em table, look at the actions of your opponents as their way of giving you knowledge that you can use as a weapon against them. For that reason, you want certain types of players to act on their hands before you do. Those players are People who play too many hands cannot possibly have a great hand every time. When you call against these players, you'll usually have the better hand, so you'll show a profit over a period of time. When you raise, the loose player will already have one bet in the pot, and he will almost always call the raise from you. If you've got a loose player on your right, you've got him trapped. While a loose player plays too many hands, a very aggressive player bets raises and re-raises too much with the fewer hands that he does play. Poker's all about being aggressive, getting your money in there when you have the best of it. When you sit at a table, someone that's equally as aggressive as you are, let them push the action, you know, you let them make the bets. You know, you just sit back, sort of lying in wait. Once they put all their money in the pot, then you just set the trap on them and kill them. By the money, I mean the player who has the most money or chips in front of them at the table, therefore appears to be the biggest winner in the game. Yes, true, he could have bought all those chips or he could just be really lucky and he won the biggest pot of the day. But without any other information, you can assume that this man or woman is a good player. So if you've spent a few minutes watching the game before you got in it, you'll know what kind of player he is and you'll be able to tell if his winnings come from skill or from luck. 
If he's really good, you want him on your right, where he'll act on his hand before you most of the time. Most of the valuable information comes from the players on your right. It usually doesn't help if you have to act on your hand before you know what the player on your left is going to do. In other words, how do you play against a player when you have to act before he does? This isn't a problem if he's the right type of player for you. There are three types of players you shouldn't mind having on your left. You can always count on passive players to play only good cards, not to raise too much before the flop unless they have premium hands, and to call too often. Additionally, these players will rarely raise when you're in the blinds, which will allow you to see a lot more flops. The maniacs are the players who play, raise, and re-raise every hand. They like to try to win with what they know are weak hands. They overbet their draws, and they almost never just call. Although you might prefer to have this player on your right, there is an advantage to having him on your left as well. Since you know he'll play and bet every hand, every round, if he's on your left, you can make extensive use of check raising when you have good hands. This helps you build the pot for those hands you expect to win. This one rule alone has a huge positive effect on your hourly rate, which is really what it's all about. The third type of player you want on your left is the player who bluffs too much. Frequently, your proper play is to check your good hands to him to give him a chance to bluff at you, especially on the river. Assuming you're gonna win the hand, your goal is to get paid off on the river. If you bet first, your bluffer has to have a hand to call you with. He'll have to fold the majority of the time. But if you check to him, he'll bluff at you more often than he'll call if you bet first. Bluffing too often is a big mistake. Give this bluffer a chance to make that mistake. Having trouble choosing your seat? Don't worry. There's also a backup plan for seat selection. If you really do not know which is the best seat in the game, or if you can't identify which players you'd rather have on your left or right, then I recommend that you sit in the third or eighth seat at the hold'em table. If you can't get the third or eighth seat, the seat on either side of these seats will work just as well. From these seats, the other players will be in your field of vision all at once. All you have to do is look up to take it all in. This is important because it's how you spot the other players' tells, which are worth a lot of money to you if you know how to interpret what you see. The ridiculously forceful bet. That's a tell. And a tell is a clue that a player provides about his poker hand by the way he or she acts. The tell can be verbal or nonverbal, made unconsciously or knowingly, and be genuine or part of a deliberate act. Now, before I get into specific tells, there are a few guidelines that apply whenever you see a tell and you're trying to analyze it. At the lower limit games, where most of the players aren't too sophisticated, popular belief holds that the best way to fool the other players is to act weak when you're strong and act strong when you're weak. It is very common to see players who have a full house act like they can't even beat ace high, and players who can't even beat ace high act like they have a full house. For this reason, I'll advise you, if you're going to act at all, act like your hand is strong when it is strong, and when it's weak, act like it's weak. Many of your opponents will think that you're lying because that's what they would do, and they'll often misread your hand. If you spot a tell and you honestly can't decide what it means, you have several options. You could stop the action, think about it until you arrive at a conclusion, and then make your play. Or you can ignore it completely and rely on the other information you have to help you evaluate the hand. Chances are, if you can't decide what a tell means after watching this video, forget about it. The best you can do is remember the tell. Remember the cards the player had when you spotted his tell, make a note of it, and think about it after the game. A player's general demeanor during the play of a hand is a big clue as to the strength of his hand. If he appears to be happy, very enthusiastic, and not worried, he probably has a good hand. If he appears to be unhappy, acts disgusted with his hand, or makes negative remarks, most likely he has a bad hand. His general demeanor won't tell you exactly what his hand is, 
but it is one more bit of information you can actually consider when making your decisions. There are many tells that you might see during the course of a Hold'em game. What follows is a list of those tells with a brief explanation of each one. These tells include specific mannerisms and general personality types. Players who quickly finish their drinks, abruptly end conversations, who suddenly sit up in their chairs, put out their cigarettes, or dismiss any spectators, usually have very good hands. You don't have to do any of these things if you intend to fold when it's your turn. A player who shows his hand to a non-player when play begins usually has a good starting hand. A player who shows his hand to a non-player at the end of a hand, particularly when all of the cards are out and he's awaiting a call from a lone opponent, usually has a bad hand. Showing it in an effort to convince the other player that he's proud of his hand. When you see this tell, the better is usually betting as a stone cold bluff. Players who continue to stare at the flop after the dealer turns it up usually did not flop anything. There's nothing there for them, and it takes a few more seconds to double check it and make sure. If you hold two sixes and the flop is ace king 10, the flop is easy to read, even if you still have to take an extra second or two to make sure you read it correctly. If you hold ace ace, however, and the flop is nine ace three, it'll look like this to you. When you see this, you'll know instantly that you're going to bet. You'll quickly glance at your chips to make sure they're still there, and then you'll look away from the table, feigning total disinterest in the hand. A player who covers his mouth after betting is usually bluffing. What you're seeing is a conflict between the external physical action of betting and the internal knowledge of knowing you're lying. A player who throws his chips into the pot in a forceful or obviously exaggerated manner is usually bluffing. A player who calls a bet by throwing his chips in the specific direction of a particular player, usually the better, is trying to intimidate the better into checking on the next round. A player will often noticeably raise his head from looking down at the flop, turn it to the left or the right to face his sole opponent squarely, and then stare right at him. In poker language, this means don't you dare bet into me. This tell occurs most often after the river card comes and a player has missed a big draw. A player who calls your bet and has his chips in the pot almost before you do has a weak calling hand. He'd rather you hadn't bet. Since you did, he wants you to have second thoughts about betting into him on the next round. A player who makes sure you accidentally see one of his hold cards is usually bluffing. He almost never has what he wants you to think he has. Whenever the flop contains a high pair, three straight flush cards, or even three of a kind, you should pause a second before acting on your hand. A player who threw away a hand with a card that would fit well with the flop will often let it be known. He might curse, moan, pound the table, slap his forehead, elbow his neighbor, or actually announce out loud what card he folded before the flop. Oh, I folded that four. I can't believe it. You have to wait to give him a second to do one of these things. This is a very reliable tell, since the player not in the hand has no reason to influence its play or outcome. A player who does this might just be bragging, but sometimes it's because he intends to bluff you in the near future, and he wants you to remember that he only plays the best hands. With a very big pot, if a player is on a draw to the nuts and misses on the end, he will often let you know about it. Again, the secret is that you have to wait a second for him to do it. He might exhale deeply, slump down in his chair, curse, look sad, turn his cards face up as a gesture of folding, throw his cards into the muck, out of turn, hit the table, or tell you what hand he missed. Rabbit hunting. No, Jethro, don't get excited. Rabbit hunting is the term for, can I see the next card, please, after the hand was over. Now, it seems the bad players like to do that, and good players generally don't. A person's style of doing one thing is usually also his style of doing most other things. It's fascinating. A player who dresses and acts conservatively usually also plays conservatively. We have just covered the most common tells that will be of use to you. 
knowing these tells will give you a huge advantage in the poker game. Make sure you're very familiar with all of the tells mentioned in this lesson and think about how you look to the other players. Try to do the same thing every time you bet. In advance, think about the physical actions that you go through when you bet or check. Do your best to keep your behavior uniform. Often your opponent will actually ask you what your hand is or what your hold cards are. My reply is always the same, and I say it with a smile. I don't remember. Now, you could also deflect the question with one of your own. What do you think I have? When you get your cards, wait until it's your turn to look at them. When the flop comes, spend that time watching the other players watch the flop. But don't do it obviously. You know, don't do it watching them like that. Those are, that's amateur hour. Really just watch it very sneaky. You have to have a peripheral around the table. You really have to have a good sense. And that's what I want to see you all do. Get out the duct tape. Don't talk about the hands you played at the table, the hands you folded, why you didn't or didn't play a hand a certain way that you would have caught on Fifth Street. It is boring. You gotta be an actor. Stay unemotional, okay? You're giving away too much. Also, don't show your hands if you're not called. Basically what I'm doing when I'm, when I'm being all talkative and fun is trying to make them relax. And the more they relax, the more they let up, they let their guard down, and that's when I get the information I need. <laughs> so many low limit players are unaware of the science of tells, and the average low limit game is so rich with them. All right, once you've learned how to recognize the most common tells and how to profit from them, you can have even greater results than you do now. Poker is really a game of people played with cards, not a game of cards played with people. The player who accepts and understands this fact and works to take advantage of it will be way ahead of the player who doesn't. Bluffing. In poker, it's pretty obvious. Everyone knows, right? Betting with a hand that you know cannot win if your bet is called. Now, players will often attempt to bluff when they're in the position of having a good flush or a straight draw that didn't work out. They're trying to win the pot by making another player fold what they believe is a better hand. Knowing when you should attempt to bluff is often just as simple as knowing the pot odds on the river. What am I talking about? Well, you have to have an idea of what's in your opponent's hand. It's when you don't have anything at all and then you read your op opponent right. You know, it's like this guy, he got two jack, but you know, an ace and a king on the board. I know there's no way this guy can call me. The mathematical rule of thumb for attempting a bluff is, the pot odds must be greater than the odds of successfully pulling off the bluff. For an example, if you estimate in your mind that you have a one in five chance of bluffing and winning, there must be more than five bets in the pot when you attempt the bluff. This is if you want to play good poker. To start with, let's look at an example of how you would break even in the long run when bluffing. Assume there are five bets in the pot, and you bet on the river as a bluff because you know you can't win any other way. If your opponent calls and beats you, you're losing one bet in the attempted bluff situation. If you do this four more times and lose all four of these times, you'll have lost five bets in an attempted bluff situation. If you try it a sixth time, and this time you win the pot, you get back those five bets along with your bet from the sixth bluff. The way to make a profit from bluffing is to have pot odds that are greater than your chances of winning the hand. What if I slightly modified the first example? We had a one in five chance of bluffing successfully. What if there were 10 bets in the pot instead of five? Well, you now have to invest and potentially lose five bets and then you'd win 10 bets when you won the hand. You'd lose four out of five times, but you'd be ahead five bets in bluffing situations overall. That's what pot odds will do for you. All right, this is a big one. You cannot bluff bad players. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they are not astute enough to recognize that you could be betting a good hand for value. They're gonna call. They're expecting to lose the hand anyway, just because they play too loose and it's worth it to them to spend the extra bet on the end just to see your hand. They want action, you're giving it to them, you lose. This carelessness is what makes them bad players. It's also very hard to bluff good players. 
Why? Because they recognize bluffing opportunities. They consider the fact that you could be bluffing when deciding to call. They're good, that's why they're good. You also cannot bluff a player who has a good hand, but who have you misread for a busted straight or a flush draw? Think about these things. All of the conditions have to be right to pull off a bluff, especially when you try to run it through more than one opponent. There's a little bit more math to bluffing that you need to understand. It has to do with how many potential callers you have when you attempted to bluff. To see this point, assume that it's equally likely, 50-50, that each player will call when you attempt to bluff on the end. If you're first and there's just one other player, the odds that you'll be successful are 50-50, one and two, or even money. If there are two other players, you have odds of one out of four, or three to one. Three players makes odds of one out of eight, or seven to one. Four players, 15 to one against. Five players, 31 to one against. You can see how these odds against you increase exponentially. They get out of hand pretty quickly, which is exactly why bluffing works best against only a few players. There's another factor that works against you when you're trying to bluff, especially when you're bluffing into more than two players. Beginning and low limit players sometimes feel that they're honor bound to call you with anything, especially as the last player in the hand who could keep you from winning the pot. All right, they wanna keep you honest. The last player will often call your attempted bluff just because he's the last player, okay? He's out on a Monday night having a good time with the boys, not because he's considering pot odds or his poker hand. I think I'm pretty good at bluffing. I think it's, uh, it's good because I have an image that people might conceive a, a female player not to be as creative and take so many risks, and I try to exploit that image. Besides your opponent's profiles, what else should you consider when deciding whether to bluff? Pot size is an important factor in your analysis. Medium-sized pots are the most difficult to steal. Why? Well, there's a reason they got to be medium-sized. It's usually because an average number of players got average cards, made average strength poker hands, and created an average size pot. If you try to bluff into one of these pots, you'll get called by, guess what? An average hand. Very small pots are the easiest to steal because there's usually a very small number of players in those hands, most of whom will fold slightly better than average hands when you bluff because they often correctly realize that they're not getting the right pot odds to call you. Now often, these players will have only one small bet invested in the pot. They don't want to do a call on a big bet on the river because there's little to win by risking so much. If you're interested in bluffing for a small pot, it helps if you keep the pot small by not betting on the flop, as long as you think it's safe to do so. You generally don't want to give free cards, but in those instances, when it's correct to do so, one of the benefits is that it might actually help you successfully bluff on the river. Very large pots can be very profitable to bluff for. The difference is that you may go a long time between winning these kind of bluffs. When you do win one though, the pot odds will more than you know, compensate for the times you lost. In summary, unless you have very good specific reasons for bluffing at medium sized pots, listen very carefully because this is very important, you should try to make the most of your bluffing attempts at very small or very large pots. I've identified instances in the game when you might or should be thinking about bluffing. Review the list occasionally to keep these points in your mind. Number one, when you have ace-king suited, if you raise before the flop and play the hand strongly from the beginning, your opponents will give you credit for a good hand. They may think you have ace-king suited, aces, or ace-king, or whatever two cards it takes to make a completed hand. If you don't make a great hand, a bluff attempt on the river may still work because they don't realize you're bluffing. Two, when you have excellent pot odds. If you missed your draw on the river and the pot is huge, you should at least give a thought to bluffing before checking and folding. Sometimes the pot is so big, it's worth a try. Three, when you're playing good players. An experienced player is capable of figuring out what you might be holding and give you credit for it. You will then make a mathematical calculation, and if he doesn't have the right pot odds to call, he'll fold. Bad players don't do this. They just call anyway. Four, 
when you're in higher stakes games, these games have better players who are capable of folding one pair or two pair when they think they're beat. Five, when the flop didn't hit anyone. If you read everyone in the hand as holding high cards and the flop is all low cards, you might be able to bluff for the pot. Six, when the board pairs on the turn, if the flop is king eight three and there's no bet, you can often steal the pot when another king comes on the turn. Someone with top pair would almost always have to bet on the flop. In this case, you can be sure that no one has three kings and your opponents will probably give you credit for them. Even if they think you might not have the kings, you've got them playing a guessing game, so they will often fold. Seven, when you're playing against just one opponent, if I have to bluff for a pot, I always prefer to be facing only one opponent. It doesn't get any better than that. Well, actually it does. Sometimes when the river card comes and it's just you and one opponent, he'll fold and concede the pot at a turn if he totally missed his draw. That is the greatest thing that can happen in a poker game. Eight, when you want to fake a rush. If your seat is hot and you've just won five of the last seven hands, you can sometimes bet with obvious fake confidence and hope your opponents will think you're still on that rush. Nine, when you're in the blind. From the blind, you could have anything, and most players recognize that. Rather than playing a guessing game, especially with a small pot, they'll fold unless they have a better than average hand. We just discussed how to look at it from the other player's point of view. Now, everything you can figure out about the other players, guess what? They can also figure out about you. And there's only one of you to keep an eye on them, but you know what? There are nine of them to watch you. That's why it is so hard to get away with anything at the poker table. Here are some situations to be aware of when thinking about a possible bluff. Number one, any flop with an ace. These flops are hard to bluff at. Players just, they wanna play every time they get an ace. If one comes on the flop, it's very likely it has made someone a pair. So you'll probably get caught. Number two, any flop with a jack or a 10. These two cards are what all good straight draws are made of. Good players usually have cards that would go well with jacks and tens. So you can see, you can practically forget about bluffing when there's both a jack and a 10 on the board. Three, if there was a pre-flop raise, this indicates that there were some strong starting hands out there and you can't be sure that one of them is an ace-ace or king-king, in which case you'll get called when you bluff on the river. Sometimes a player will raise before the flop with a pair of fours just for fun, and then call it on the river just for fun. Four, many players in the hand. That's right, I've already mentioned this as a problem, but it's well worth keeping in mind all the time. One, seems like he missed a flush or a straight draw. Maybe the flush had two cards of the same suit and another one didn't come on the turn or the river. Or maybe there was an obvious straight draw that didn't get there. In a case like that, his only option might be to try a bluff. Number two, it's just the two of you. If he's first to bet or if you're first and you check to him, he could be bluffing. He won't always be bluffing just because there are only the two of you but it is something you should keep in mind. Number three, it cost him only one bet to steal the pot. If your opponent can induce you to make a mistake that will cost you the pot, and he can do so for only one little bet, clearly he'll want to try that. Number four, the pot is huge. Need I say more? Any pot with more than 15 big bets qualifies in most players' minds as a huge pot, and it's worthy of a steal attempt. Number five, the player betting on the river, who's therefore possibly bluffing, raised preflop, and no aces, kings, or queens are on the board. Number six, everyone checked on any round of the hand. This usually means that no one flopped anything worth protecting. Number seven, when two or more of the above reasons to believe your opponent might be bluffing are both true, the more likely it is that he is bluffing. The best bluff tip is there is no best bluff tip. Everybody's different. You gotta know your player. You gotta sit there for days upon end or hours upon end to learn every individual player because everybody acts, up, acts differently. 
Maybe you've noticed that most of my advice on how to play relies on you having an idea of what your opponents are holding. That's true. By now you're probably asking, how could I know what they have with any certainty? Do not worry. It is possible to figure out what they have and sometimes their hands will even be quite obvious. But knowing your opponent's hands usually requires you to take in a lot of different information correctly and quickly and arrive at a conclusion in time to play your hand without holding up the game. If you're trying to read another player's hand, some of the questions you might ask yourself are, one, what do I already know about this player? Two, has he played a hand like this before? Three, what position is he in? Four, is he in the blind? Five, did he raise before the flop? Six, did he call a raise before the flop? Seven, did he check raise on any round of the hand? Eight, did he call a check raise? Nine, how does he react to other players' bets and raises? 10, have I picked up any tells from this player? 11, statistically speaking, what are the odds that he holds the hands that I think he might hold? 12, why did he raise before the flop, on the flop, or on the turn or river? 13, why didn't he raise before the flop, on the flop, or on the turn or river. 14, if I put myself in his place and I played the hand the way he has from the beginning, what would I have? 15, what are his pot odds? 16, what does my common sense, experience, and logic tell me he might have? Of all the skills required to be a good Hold'em player, the ability to read hands is one of the most time-consuming and difficult to master. It requires that you play or watch many, many hands, and that you expend the mental energy necessary to work through each hand so you arrive at the right conclusions. It also requires that you pay attention to the game and the players in progress, even when you're not in the hand, which is something that the average low-limit player doesn't want to do. All of this assumes that you started with a good, solid, practical, and theoretical understanding of all the other aspects of the game. So, if you already play in a regular game, the good news is that you've already had some practice reading hands, even if you're not an expert yet. You already know about the possible combinations of questions you can ask about the play of a hand and about the many different situations that can arise. Fortunately, many of these situations and questions are so similar that they can be reduced to a manageable number that will give you a satisfactory conclusion most of the time. Because of the huge number of variables involved in reading hands and the impossibility of covering every feasible combination of events in the play of a hand, I'm gonna help you learn how to read hands by having you do the next assignment. The next time you play in your usual game, pay attention to those times that a player bets and is called on the river. Doesn't matter if you're in the hand or not. If you've been following the action from the beginning and you've been trying to read that player's hand, I want you to come up with an educated guess of what his hand might be. It'll help if you decide at the beginning of the hand to use that hand as part of this assignment. I want you to tell yourself exactly which two cards the player might be holding. When the player in question is called on the river and he reveals his hand, you'll see that your guess will, of course, fall into one of three categories. Number one, you'll have guessed that his hand is worse than it is. Number two, you'll have guessed that his hand is better than it is. And number three, you'll have been right on the mark. And that is a great feeling. Your goal, of course, is to have more and more of your guesses be right with each passing playing session. Remember, it's his pocket cards you're trying to guess, not just his final poker hand. These are tools that are proven. However, in poker, just like in life, Nothing is exactly as it seems. So stay deceptive, be an enigma, and play with honor. And remember, keep owning your skills, because we might be meeting at the final table one day. Guess they did real well. Guess we have to shuffle up and deal. I might get myself in here. Action would be on. Nice. Okay, we're tightening up, huh? Here we go. Who's gonna raise it? 
right. Yeah, you gotta laugh too at this game, right? Very good. All right, here we go. There's the flop. Burn and the flop. Look at this. Learning quickly. She's betting right. Nice. Okay, it's a nice tie. That's good. Tight game. Very good. All right. Hand number one. It's over. The Ultimate Poker Company is dedicated to making you the best poker player you can be. At ultimatepokercompany.com, our website is filled with books, videos, and poker playing accessories to make you a complete poker player. You'll also find additional tips, commentary, and information on poker tournaments and events. Log on now to www.ultimatepokercompany.com.